Hey everyone, it's Sirsha. Today we have a real floral theme going on because I'm going to talk to you about a book that has to do with gardening. It is Seed to Dust by Mark Hamer. Life, Nature, and a Country Garden. This is the second in a sort of gardener's trilogy. I did a video on the first one, it was How to Catch a Mole, and if you watched that video, you remember that I was raving about it. I loved that book so much, and this one did not disappoint. Um, I can't wait for the third one. <clears throat> I believe he just finished writing it, and it's called Tales of Spring Rain. I really hope that comes out soon. It would be so cool because I read the first one in January, this one in June, July, and to read the other one at the end of the year would be nice, So, but I have no idea how publishing works. Maybe it'll be a while. Um, so I'll read you the jacket here. Uh, this was published in 2021. Climbing hydrangeas, vibrant dahlias, poisonous hellebores, and blood-red peonies. These are just a few of the plants that Mark Hamer cares for as the gardener of a 12-acre estate in the Welsh countryside. The garden belongs to an isolated elderly widow whom Hamer calls Miss Cashmere, who rarely speaks to him but watches from afar. Month by month, over the course of a full calendar year, Hamer reflects on the cycles of birth, growth, life, and decay in nature, on the aches of his body, on the meditative and repetitive nature of gardening, on the fleeting beauty of each plant, and on the daily rituals that keep him whole, and he comes to a greater understanding of both Miss Cashmere's life and his own. Deeply poetic and strikingly illustrated, Seed to Dust is an evocative reflection on the joys of caring for plants and the mysteries of being alive, and a stunning work of nature writing about life lived in the garden, where the new and the beautiful and the dying all grow. So, you might know by now, I am obsessed with nature writing. When I can find a good memoir that is also good nature writing, it basically like this gave me everything that I wanted. And I was crying from the first page and was astonished by how many times I was crying throughout it. Like every page I'd be putting, I put so many tabs in this book. And I would just, there were some lines where I would start weeping all of a sudden, like you don't see it coming, you know, it's really meditative and calm and you're just talking about plants and, and then there's just something that, oh, like, stabs you in the gut. Um, I just really, really like this style. It's, it's, it's not going to be a, like, how-to manual on how to grow a garden. Um, there are a lot of descriptions of plants, but it's not, like I would say, a textbook. So if you're looking for that, this isn't the right thing, but if you're not looking for that and you don't know much about plants, don't be afraid of it. You know, there's scientific names and all that, and I'll probably pronounce things wrong, but it's really, for me, a philosophical text. Um, it, it really helped me think about how I can live in the moment, why the present is the only thing that's real. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it really felt like meditating. Like I, every time I sat down to read it, just felt 10,000 times more calm. And I kind of run at a pretty anxious level most of the time. So to just open this book and immediately feel calm, that was very special. Also, I have this little plant friend here. You can't really see him, but he's here. I don't know what this is exactly, but um, I grew it from a cutting that a friend gave to me. And if you smell it, you rub the leaves and smell it, it smells exactly like Vicks Vapo Rub, which I don't know if this is in other places in the world, but um, at least where I grew up, you'd rub that on your chest when you were congested and it's just this strong stinky like menthol smell um that is what this plant smells like and so it's really nostalgic <laughs> i love it okay should we just dive right in to some of my favorite things from this book i am guessing this video is gonna run long so first off i really like how it's laid out because you have the entire year, the calendar year. So it starts with January, and then you get February, March, and so on. So you get to experience this garden growing 
like in real time it feels like and it's interspersed with um, little bits about the author's life and I find all of it so fascinating. Um, I know that that a book about somebody just kind of walking around a garden reflecting and being very in the moment and um, enjoying a simple flower or a simple insect that's not everybody's cup of tea. It is absolutely my cup of tea. Um, I've said this a million times. I'm not, I'm not a reader who reads to get a lot of plot and action and crazy stuff. I want, I want a meditative, reflective kind of, whether it's fiction or memoir, um, I want a character, you know, first person narrative that makes me feel like I'm in that person's head or they're letting me kind of have a window into what they think and I don't really care if very much happens so okay let's dig in we're gonna start right on the right on the first page written in a tradition as old as storytelling itself in essence what is here is truth although in fact it is often not what follows is drawn from memory, and just like any other drawing, any other memory, perspectives are distorted, time is contracted, and the sun shines in the imagination where in reality there was only shade. So that was the first time I started crying because it really made me think about how we remember things, we often remember things better than they were. So sometimes, sometimes it's the opposite, but I think most of the time for me, I can be so nostalgic about things that I went through that in the time when they were happening, I was not happy. You know, I think of this a lot about my year in Scotland when I was living there, going to grad school. It was dark and cold and gray and I definitely wasn't happy per se. You know, I had a lot of interesting things happen and like new experiences and adventures, but I wish that I had started keeping a journal then instead of later that year because it would be really interesting to to be able to see that's the important thing about keeping a journal I write in one every single day now um, you're able to see what you actually felt in the moment because your memories lie to you so because I didn't keep a journal I look back at that year and I think about it with you know rose-colored glasses and I think the sun was shining when it wasn't. Um, it really wasn't. So I just, I love how he talks about um, that that kind of sneaky nature of of memory and words and anything that can sort of be altered to fit what we want it to fit. It's really hard to to um, articulate, which is why it's so impressive that he's able to do it in these books. <clears throat> I think that's what gets me the most, is when, when I come across a sentence that feels like the author pulled that from my soul and, and, you know, gave it words when I couldn't find words for it, that really is impactful. Um, here he says, I will no longer set traps for the moles, throw their soft bodies to the crows. I'm done with the demeaning business of killing things, a business that worked away at me little by little until I felt closed inside. So in this book, I feel like we're seeing him become true to himself and <laughs> doing what my therapist calls living by your values, um, which has been helpful that she's taught me that phrase, though sometimes... I get frustrated because I'm like, I know I'm not living by my values, but don't call me out on it. Um, but you read in, in the first book about him catching moles and how he decides at the end he's not going to do it anymore. And I think it's really, it's really fascinating reading about someone who is open to talk about aging and the way that we change as we age and the things that we're not as willing to do anymore, the bits of our soul that we're not as willing to give up in order to make a life. <clears throat> so there's a bit here about um, our possessions 
um, you know, people seeking wealth and things and trying to live forever through these things. I think I've mentioned before how interesting it is that, you know, I'm going to bring up the Titanic, that there are things still sitting on the bottom of the Atlantic that have survived much longer than the physical forms of all of the people who went down with the ship. So we have this, this silly notion that if we just collect a lot of things, somehow it, it makes our life... I don't know how to phrase it. It's just we think it's, it makes us immortal, in a way. But our things will continue to go on and sit in landfills, pretty much, and, and last forever, and we won't. Um, so he works in this garden um, for this woman for many years. Um, but he says, this is not my garden, but it's not hers either. Just paying for something doesn't make it yours. Nothing is ever yours. People who work with the earth and the people who think they own bits of it see the world in totally different ways. Just letting that sink in. People who think they own bits of it see the world. <sighs> so many people think they, they can own this planet, which is so crazy when you really stop and think about it. I don't know. I get. I don't know a lot about property laws and whatever. Having a deed to a land, is that something that we say now or is that just cowboys? Cowboys had... whatever, don't listen to me. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about the, the book Holes, how they had they found like all of those deeds to land, or I think it, that's what it was, and that was worth like so much money even many, many years later. When really nobody owns anything, and our little pieces of paper saying that we own them are just so embarrassing when you think about it. Any garden belongs to everyone who sees it. It is like a book, and everybody who visits it will find different things. Not many people see this place now. The window cleaner, me, Miss Cashmere, the odd tradesman, a delivery person who can't find the front door and wanders around the back. This garden, like most others, is a trick that looks a bit like nature, but isn't really. It is written deliberately to lead the viewer into a collection of stories using color and form, light and shade, to elicit personal emotions, to seed the imagination, to spark a journey of remembrance of forgotten things, a drift into childhood games or young loves or thoughts of people, parents, past lives, fantasies in bright open spaces or private contemplation in the shade. So I like this because this is what I always say about stories, books, movies even, whatever, any kind of storytelling. It, it doesn't become what it is until it's filtered through our, um, our own interpretation and our experience of the world. So you will never see the same movie as somebody else, you will never read the same book as someone else, you'll never be in the same garden as someone else, because everything that has made us who we are is informing our experience at the time of being in this garden. I just think that's fascinating. How many times will I say fascinating? Um, here he talks about how Miss Cashmere's husband died at some point in the past. The people stood around him in his box, and then they wheeled him off to the cemetery, and they made him in his box into ashes as dry and brittle as life, and mixed them with the earth and sent him back to where he came from, and that was him done. He is just a story now. Just love that. Um, you know, I read a lot about death, think a lot about death, um, so any description of it that stands out to me. I always have to remember it. And I just, I've always liked the idea of going back to the earth um, that we came from. And that was him done. He is just a story now. I mean, it's so, it's so simple when you say it like that. And, and yet we make so much of it. I know I do. Um, place so much importance on our mortality. When, I mean, none of us are getting out alive, so probably shouldn't worry so much. Um, here he talks more about his youth and how he used to live in this city where, I can't even remember where, um, but everybody like worked in 
factories and places that were not healthy and there was the, the bleach works where young women worked and um, they would become completely white head to toe from working around bleach and it's such a horrifying image so like just mind-blowing um, the uh, they ignored me a child some of the younger ones not much older than me 15 perhaps had just left school the bleach worked fast and even they were white from head to toe the older ones who didn't work anymore the retired grandmothers who came with prams so mums could see their babies in the lunch breaks looked fresh-faced, um, smooth-skinned, and pinker than their daughters, appearing decades younger than their years, often with tinted hair, blue or purple rinses. You never really saw old women then, not around there, and no really old men either. They died young, like the miners, coughing their lungs out, bubbling pink blood onto white handkerchiefs, and those babies came in prams to see where they would work when they grew up. That was one of those lines that just like, oh, ow. Um, this cycle of, of poverty, it's, it's so upsetting to read it laid out like that. The babies come to see where, where they're going to work when they grow up so that they can have the same life and die in the same way, early, young, because of this work that they've been made to do. Um, <clears throat> if you, you know, wanted another reason why I, I don't want to have kids. I don't know, I read stuff like that and I just wonder how you, why would you want to continue that cycle by having children? Everybody makes their own choices, it's just, it makes me so sad. Oh, here's a bit about toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. What is wrong with me today? Um, I don't talk much, like, out loud to other humans lately. Um, so my voice doesn't work. Much later, I learned that it was okay to enjoy pretty things, but as a male in that particular world, the list of things I was allowed to enjoy was very restricted, either sentimental or concerned with power and competition, and I was not to use the word pretty to describe them. I could enjoy flowers, for instance, dahlias or roses, but only if I grew them competitively, aiming for a standard that had been devised by a committee of some sort, and entered them in shows to win medals. Conformity was key. Certainty written down in books that clearly defined what was a win and what was not. Prettiness or vague liking just because was not an allowed part of the process. Clarity was everything. Everything I grew to despise. Win or lose was all that mattered. It's, it's so upsetting, the, um, the bits that he writes about his childhood and the way that that older men treated him and made him feel, you know, that he was not being a man um, just for liking pretty things, for having a different way of thinking and seeing the world and not being so angry because the way that toxic men deal with any kind of feeling, you know, a broken heart, a loss of a loved one, anything, it just comes out as anger because they're not allowed to show it in any other way and they're punished if they show it in any other way. And I, yeah, I've said enough about it. It just, it's devastating. That we should, we should be encouraging people to be themselves, be individuals and, and cope with things in a way that isn't toxic. But unfortunately, the cycle continues. This bit is just really a beautiful, beautiful um, few sentences. As I leave in the late afternoon, there is a frosting sky, clear as ice, rusting straw colored. I can feel tiny, sharp ice crystals falling on my face as the, as the cold sun sets, glittering in the rough weave of my wool jacket. Daphne blossoms on bare stems is still Daphne Daphne blossom on bare stems is still pink in the last of the day's light. Oh, I have to ruin it by just stuttering through it. But um there's such beautiful descriptions in this book. It's very poetic prose. I just love frosting sky clear as ice, rusting straw colored. 
Tiny sharp ice crystals falling on my face as the cold sun sets, glittering in the rough weave of my wool jacket. I can just picture that jacket with the little ice crystals. So beautiful. Here we have a bit where he's, um, this is, this is one of those just like conceptual things that I could not have put into words and I'm grateful for this passage. He's talking about moving compost, um, and he says, I throw nine heavy forkfuls into the barrow until it crests the top, then push the load across an acre or more of lawn, tip it out and spread it around the roses, and go back for more loads to spread where the lupins and gladioli crowns are showing signs of green. Um, then six more barrows to where the bank of red tulip bulbs are buried, then another five on the bed where I'll plant the dahlias, and as I count, I wonder why I'm counting. There could be only two reasons. Either it is that so I it is so that I can complain about my life, or so that I can brag about how hard I've worked, and there isn't anybody to brag or complain to. I stop counting. There is no earthly use in knowing. Isn't that interesting? Why do we count? We're either trying to complain or to brag. And I do this all the time with everything, absolutely every little thing. I have to count, I have to think about um, the like specific dates when I did something and like how many days was it from this to this and, and why does it matter? The accumulation of, of time and numbers and it just, if we're not trying to complain or brag, why do we need to know? I guess if you're like, a detective on a murder case and, and numbers are important and fine. But I doubt that will ever be my reality. That just made me feel a bit more like free. Like, oh I don't have to don't have to count anymore. I don't I don't have to place so much importance on it's like I think if I if I can quantify something, I can make sense of it. But you can't quantify everything. Anyway. Um, he talks about how his books are chaotic. He says he has a separate bookshelf from his wife. I want to be distracted by something I hadn't thought of when I'm looking for something. I crave random encounters in my ordered seasonal life, but only as far as books and nature are concerned. Random encounters with people are something I try to avoid. I am clumsy and often misunderstand the purpose of talking with others. That's such a nice thought, having a random encounter with a book. My books are fairly, fairly organized. Not entirely. I have sections like, you know, there's all the Brontes are on a shelf. All of Tolkien's books are on a shelf. And then I have um, shelves of young adult books. But then within, within those sections, I don't really put things in a specific place. I definitely don't alphabetize. <laughs> definitely not. Um, you know, I've got like a true crime section, um, classics, poetry, but it is fun to just stumble upon a book um, when you don't really expect to see it there. Sometimes I do shelve things very strangely, which means I can't find them when I want them, but when I do find them, it's like, oh, there you are. Isn't that exciting? This is a comforting bit for me. We will lose those that we love, and that will hurt. We will die, and for many, dying will be physically painful. All this will end, and we will want things to be different. That is as it should be. Everything passes, and this perfect moment will not be repeated in all the history of time, nor this one. Just nice to understand that grief and loss are completely normal. You can't get through life without them. You just can't. Um, so yeah, it just helps for me to read it. You know, when other people say that, because it's like, I know rationally these things. But my brief brain is so chaotic that I can't allow myself to really think rationally. Uh, 
I don't usually have much call for concern about things, for my life is simple and inexpensive. But now as I, as I have grown older, I find myself spending time organizing myself so that I don't lose my keys and glasses. I discover myself making plans, but I have rarely in my life made plans. I used to think that one either made plans to do a thing or one did the thing. I felt that making plans was a way of not doing the thing, but pretending that you had. I used to change my position, move from one place to another, and view the world as I wandered. But more and more I find that my position remains the same, and I view the world as it goes past. I do not wander anymore. Those words come and scare the living daylights out of me. I do not wander anymore. In years, in years gone by, I would pick up my jacket on the way out and not return for three days. Now I make plans for things that I do not do. That's a, that is a tough thing to acknowledge. And I really, I feel that, I relate to that, that I used to just wander. I, I had so many adventures that would take me to places I didn't even know I was going to go. Um, and things are just different. And I just, I really like and appreciate the way that he said that there is a certain comfort in having a place where you belong and having a home and having sort of a steady routine or a few responsibilities. Um, but there is this kind of thing in our souls, at least those of us who have retained that, I think, kind of animalistic wandering, um, what is the word? propensity to wander. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, but yeah, for those of us, it's just, it's in us to always want to be exploring. And I mean, that's why they call it wanderlust. And so it can be frustrating when you're pulled between that and the current comfort of your life. And one or the other isn't necessarily bad. It's just, you, you can't have both in the exact same moment, really. There's a lot about cats, because he has a cat, and um, this cashmere has a couple cats. Some of my closest relationships have been with cats. All of them have been teachers, and time spent with them is never wasted. Watching them luxuriate and do nothing but stretch out, I am reminded to let go and only use energy when I need to. To stay calm and still when nothing else is required. I've learned a lot from my babies. Um, I know I've talked about them before. I have two beloved cats, Springer and Caddy. And they're, they've been with me, I mean, even if they hadn't been with me for long, I, we just, it, we have a soul connection. And like, I am them, they are me. We're just, we're so connected. Um, and yeah, we, we have been, since I found them pretty much 11 years ago, um, it was just something, there's something about them, it's like I, I knew them, and I have always known them, will always know them, and yeah, they've definitely, they have taught me a ton. And now there, there are a couple of kittens that have been born outside my window in here, and I've been watching them and their mother. And they're just so cute together, and she's doing such a good job. Um, they're all black cats. They're so adorable. Okay, I've got cat brain now, so I've completely lost my train of thought. When I have been separated from the land, from the cycles of nature and the weather, working in factories or offices, I have become distanced from my own mortality, from feelings of being a human being in the world. I have become at times like a machine, programmed to produce and to consume, and my behavior and attitudes became polluted and strange to me. I, I feel endlessly bad for people who have to work like a nine to five in an office people who whose jobs don't allow them to ever see the sun. There were times when I worked at Disney where I would go in before the sun rose and come out 
after the sunset, and this would be like in the winter when the days are shorter, and the location where I was working, you, you know, you go into the tunnel at Disney when you're working there at Magic Kingdom. So you're in a tunnel, there's no daylight, and the location, the break room, there were no windows. Um, and when you are like in this location, you are technically above ground now, but we, we had windows in, in the actual room that were fake. They weren't real windows. You couldn't see anything through them. It was all part of the facade. And so I just wouldn't see the sun at all. And it was it's so depressing. Um, I guess not everybody is affected by that, but anyway, any sort of job where you're, you're forced to miss out on nature, I think that's so detrimental and so dangerous for people because you can see humans as having evolved so far that we are separate from nature, but I don't, I don't see that. I think we are nature and we are animals and we have taken ourselves so far away from our true, our true nature um, that we don't recognize it anymore. And this is why I love hiking so much. You know, when I'm out there for weeks and months, I I feel alive in a different way, in a way that I, I kind of recognize as this, I don't know how to say it. <clears throat> it's like the purest form of myself when I'm just out in the wild and every day is survival, um, but also having the time and the space to watch a sunrise across the mountains, um, to see a porcupine in a tree, you know, just little things that when you're rushing around in your city life that you don't think about. Um, Um, here he's talking about the philosopher Seneca. He argues that much of life is not life, but merely time, living as if we would live forever, guarding our money viciously, yet squandering our time on useless activities and obsessions, arguments, wars and battles, politics, sorrow, and working to build wealth, while making plans to retire one day so that we might please ourselves and start living life properly, as if a future were guaranteed and death was not. They know their time is limited, he says but they continue to complain and carry on, and would not change even if they lived a thousand years. They let their lives slip away as if they were worthless. I will try not to go off on a tangent about this, but I do talk about it a lot. The absolute travesty and horror of the fact that we are just born and work and work and work and work and then retire, have a little bit of time left, and then die. That's not what we're made for. Um, and the, the fact that our, our best physical years are spent being unable to really do the things that we want to do because we're trapped working, it's, it's so deeply unfair. Um, I'm glad there are countries now that are trying out, you know, not having a 40-hour work week. It just, the fact that that so many of us have to get up in the dark and then go spend our best waking hours somewhere else away from our actual life and then have barely enough time to make dinner and go to sleep and do it all over again, that, that cycle, and then telling ourselves that we're doing it so that we can build a little fortune so that we can have it when we're in our elderly years and not as physically able to do things that we would have used that money for before, like a, maybe a really adventurous um, vacation that involves like mountain climbing. You can't do it anymore, but now you've got all the time and the money. Um, it's disgusting. Okay, I'm gonna stop my tangent. <sighs> Digging into the past always pollutes the present. 
Writing this book, I scrape a little mud off the past, and the feelings that are released have nothing to do with this moment, and I wonder why I do it. So, for as much as there is about living in the present in this book, there is quite a bit about the past, and mainly how unimportant and unreliable it is, and this just got me thinking about how I, like how I particularly struggle with um, thinking about the past in, in a specific way. I can't look at old photos. I can look at some, and you know, I'm not gonna like spontaneously combust if I see old photos, but I don't feel happy um, because I, I see an image that was captured and, and I know all the feelings behind it. I know that even if I'm smiling that I've been battling depression my whole life and I know what's behind that picture and that moment and that day. Um, and I think about every association with that time in my life and, um, you know, what abusive relationship was I in? What was I struggling with personally? What, what loss was I experiencing? And, you know, all of that is behind a picture of me at like a mini golf place. Um, so it just doesn't feel worth it to me to, to look through those, which is really sad because I have had some wonderful experiences and I wish that everything wasn't so tied to everything else in my memory. But here's a bit about staying present. Good timing. Um, the candlesticks of conquer flowers have gone, but in the shade a few magnolia flowers hang on, and rhododendrons and azaleas that have been blooming for weeks are now fading, turning from pink and orange and yellow to gorgeous fading rust. This ever-changing here and now absorbs all of my attention. I will not waste a moment of my life imagining what could and could not become, reimagining what has or may have been. Perfect. There's a wonderful bit here where um, he talks to Miss Cashmere and she's clearly not doing very well mentally and he suggests that she take off her shoes and walk barefoot in the grass. Um, and that's, you know, that's like a really wild thing to suggest to this rich old lady and she does it. And then it says, How far away from the plants and birds she had seemed. All she had to do was go quiet and let them in. They were knocking, knocking on her door, and she couldn't hear them. That makes me want to cry. Like, it's that simple sometimes. Sometimes it really is. Just take off your shoes and walk in the grass, and oh, you're reconnected to this earth, this thing that is the most important thing. Um, it's the giver of all life, and, you know, if we lose our planet, we lose everything. Just simply walking on the grass can be so, um, rejuvenating and life-affirming. You know, I always think, like, I, I wish I didn't live in Florida, I wish that I lived in the mountains, and that I could walk out my front door and go for a real hike. Um, but because I've been stuck here, I've had to remind myself, you can experience nature here, even though it's not the kind of nature that maybe you want. I'm not a um, beach person, really. I'm not into, um, what do you call this? Swamp, basically. <laughs> um, Florida's a big old swamp. It's not my kind, my preferred kind of nature. I love mountains. I love pine forests. I love, I just love a different kind of land, um, but because I'm here, I've found that um, I can actually take joy in a lot of the nature that I have right in my backyard, you know, because there isn't much in this urban sprawl that I live in, but in my backyard, I've got this fantastic tree that has got to be a million years old. It's massive, and uh, many other trees around my yard, and there's so much life in all of them, and I get so many birds that are really fun to watch, and of course lizards, more lizards than you could ever want, um, all of the neighborhood cats that hang out in my yard, and then my cats and I, we sit in the catio, which is a like screened off porch with shelves for the cats, 
we sit there and we just watch everything and I've let my backyard go completely wild now. I won't mow it anymore. So it is just taken over and um, I've thrown some wildflower seeds out there. I don't know if they'll do anything, but I'm just watching the earth sort of take back this space that has been tamed for so long. And it's really doing something for my soul. So I sit out there and, and look at all the insane plants just taking over and um, and sometimes I'll sit out in a thunderstorm and that's something that is really special about living in Florida. At least there, we have that. We have really spectacular thunderstorms. Um, so yeah, nature is there and it's waiting for you and you, you just have to look. Um, just take your shoes off. I always like have my shoes off when I go like outside to take the trash out and I end up stepping on sand spurs and that which is fine in August there is a tiny growing space in me that is painfully aware that autumn is coming it brings the sadness of endings and the joy of beginnings they both come from the frailty of living things. In the middle of the brightness of summer, I become aware of the shade of death. We know that there is no beauty without impermanence. There is no light without shadow. Yet there is a sadness that comes from not knowing how to keep the things and people we love from dying. The sadness that is itself a lovely, delicate thing. It's an interesting thought. Um, that there is no... There's no joy without sorrow. There's like, can, in a void, um, can somebody who is just happy be happy and know what happiness is without having experienced sadness? I don't know. Um, because in my life I've only known having both intertwined with each other um, and feeling the intensity of one because I know the intensity of the other. But yes, anyway, that is the thing about loving anyone, any living thing. Um, we're all mortal. And so I think that was um, in the good place. There's this great line about, like, how, how do you humans deal with the fact that you're all going to die and everyone you love is going to die and... Um, the answer is, well, we're all just a little bit sad all the time, and that's okay, because we're all so joyful and, um, curious, and it's okay that that sadness exists, it has to exist. It's kind of part of the deal. Um, here's another bit about counting. Nature does not count. It only knows need and not need. Man has a childish relationship with numbers. How much have you got? How much have I got? Whether it is money, time, or love. And what does that say about me in relation to you? Um, nearly every time I go into the Forster's Arms, there is a man who, who I think is called Martin and his wife. He has a haulage business. I did know his name, but have forgotten it. He gets drunk a lot and is very unhappy. Every night he destroys a few more cells in his brain and his liver and kidneys. His wife gets drunk too, and for the same reason. It does not matter how many houses he has got how many employees, how expensive his new car is. He can't make himself happy with the numbers. He tells anybody who will listen about his car or house or holiday. He thought the numbers would save him. He has lost his connection and is trying to destroy himself. Hmm. Yeah, I do a lot of thinking when I, when I read this book. I just... He thought the numbers would save him. Again we focus so much on what doesn't matter because it's kind of easier for us to conceptualize it and we forget about the things that actually matter. We ignore them. I learned that certainty about anything is a fantasy that belongs to those who need it because their sense of self depends on it. I found that searching for meaning would get me into the hands of those who would like to have power over me or wanted another mindless soldier to fight their cause. Um, this is a great way to think about religion. Um, you're searching for meaning, and here's this 
real handy dandy book or group of people or church or whatever telling you we've got the answers, we've got the meaning, we've got certainty, um, when they don't. Nobody does. And that's all religion is, it's just desperately trying to make sense of the things that, that we can't make sense of. It's, it's the way that we used to explain things before we knew science. Um, and unfortunately it's stuck around and it's got its hooks in people. And so that's where they derive their meaning and therefore kind of lose touch with the fact that nothing is certain and we're not here for a purpose, we're not here for anything. We just are. Um, so he talks about how he was looking for answers in his life and, and realized what he was searching for is actually a question, just like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I eventually found a worthwhile question, and it was this. What am I supposed to do with this life that I've chosen to hang on to, this path I've decided to follow? I allowed this question into my empty head as I wandered, and the answers came, exploding at me from all directions like clouds of seeds from a field of dandelions. Experience it, said the water crashing over the rocks. Enjoy it, said the crows. Just live it, called the wood pigeons. Survive it, barked the fox. Feel the flow, said the seeds carried on the breeze. For what else is there, said the clouds. This answer has always led to another question. How to bear it? How to be happy when there is so much suffering in the world? Um, he goes on to talk about seeing homeless people and poor people and how he was one of them and, um, you know, all of this exists and the answer, the only answer there is, came and as much as I tried to regain my anger, the answer came again and again, be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, for the rest there is no knowing and where there is no knowing there is no point asking. And I say that all the time, just if we could just be kind, what a difference it would make. And it's, I, I know it's easier said than done, but God, do you, do you ever just think about that? Every little thing that would have been changed, the things that were so negative that you experienced that would have been changed just by a tiny bit of kindness, of understanding and patience from another human being. Um... Whoa, missing that sad, lovely, lonely feeling of freedom, of not seeing or hearing another human, being able to see from my vantage point that there is nobody for miles around, being able to see into the future as the weather moves toward me, feeling my connection with the landscape, without the distractions of human chatter or verbal clutter. I close my eyes and find the candle flame, then look for the grassy saddle of earth between two hills, where a few hardy mountain sheep graze and watch, warm myself in the sun between the peaks, Listen to the clear, icy water falling through the rocks. Feel the crisp mountain air on my skin and in my lungs, then open my eyes, knowing that I do not have to be in the wilderness, because I have the wilderness in me whenever I need it. Mm. I love that sentence. And that is how I felt when I was through hiking the Appalachian Trail. Um, I learned, after six months of being in the wilderness, that I can carry that with me, it's always with me, because as I said before, we are nature. Um, we can't, as much as we try to fully separate ourselves from that truth, um, it's within us, and trying to take ourselves farther away from the wild has done things to us um, that are very damaging. And so I just like that reminder. Oh, my goodness, this is a long one. Um, Nietzsche, as part of his eternal recurrence idea, suggests that if in your coldest, loneliest moment a demon were to creep in and tell you that you would have to live this whole life over again from beginning to end, innumerable times, again and again, with nothing new in it, every pain and joy again, and even the demon's visitation again, such a thing would soon become unbearable and most of us would resist. Apart from those fortunate few who have lived a happy and comfortable life, who would see the demon as a god and say, yes, please, this life is beautiful, but there is no such beauty in eternity. Its glory is only because it ends. Looking back on those glorious years, in time they will collapse into a sweet little story. There we are again. Everything is fleeting, everything is limited, um, and that makes it 
all the more precious. Okay, last one. I don't believe in any kind of god. If there is such a beast, he has horns and hooves and plays the pipes and doesn't live in the sky for us to look up to and worship, but underground and pushes all the wonderful things out of the soil for us to admire, pushes us out into the world, then takes us back again to join the earth, a creator that gives us passion and music and lust. That's my kind of deity, should I ever need one. Okay, so if it's not obvious, I highly, highly recommend this book. Um, I want to experience reading it again. I'll have to just wait a few years and forget everything and go back and read it again. Um, and I can't even say like which one I enjoyed more, this or How to Catch a Mole. They both have that aspect of philosophy and, um, and being present and being one with nature. Um, but this, I don't know, this is just so, it's so original, unlike anything I've read, and I'm so grateful that it exists, and that Mark Hamer is writing in a time when I am alive, and I get to read it. So, definitely looking forward to his next book, and, um, if you have read these, what are your thoughts? Um, if you've read How to Catch a Mole, definitely move on to this one. I just can't say enough good things about it. It feels so pe peaceful just just like seeing it in my house when I was reading it and leaving it in different in places where I'd pick it up next. I would see it and just feel like <sighs> more calm and happier and and kind of also thinking that you know happiness isn't the end-all be-all and it's more just kind of existence and becoming okay with the accumulation of moments and living in each one and not having to put so much pressure on each one to be something grand. <sighs> anyway, um, all of my rambling can never really do justice to books like this, so just read it, please, and um, tell me about your plants, because I know there are a lot of really good plant parents out there. I am not great. Um, I need to learn a lot, and to be honest, being out in my hot Floridian garden, um, it's not, it's kind of impossible most of the year for me because it's just too hot, um, but I've tried to grow some things, like mostly, you know, cat-friendly plants in the house, and there's just not the right light in this house, it's pretty dark, um, I do have some pothos plants that have been going forever that seem to be okay with the dark, um, and they're kept high away from the plant, away from the cats. But I miss, every day I miss my basil plants that I had in Scotland. I had this little yogurt container um, that I took the label off of and I wrapped it in brown paper and I grabbed some dirt from the park nearby and carried it in a bag home, put it in the pot, and then planted a bunch of basil seeds, and I had the most glorious, wonderful, abundant basil, and I was just keeping it on the windowsill in my bedroom, and it just loved it there, and obviously I couldn't bring it with me when I moved back here, I miss it so much, um, and I tried growing basil here, and it was not the same results at all, but I just, I think about that plant, just that little yogurt pot being on my windowsill, and every morning I would look at it, and every time I got home, I'd look at it, my cats would sniff Oh my god, I'm sorry. My cats would sniff it. That always goes off when I'm filming. I really need to turn that off and just do my Duolingo without the alarm. Um, my cats would sniff the basil, and... Um, yeah, because it's, it's cat safe. And it would make me so happy to see them interacting with it. So it's just... Yeah, when I look back at that time and think about how, how dark some of that year was, and that little plant was just there making me so happy and just watching it get bigger and bigger. It was such a joyful, peaceful thing. Um, yeah, love plants. Wish I knew more about gardening. And I don't know if that'll ever be who I am, if I'll be like the garden lady. Um, but I'm glad that I have books like this to read about people who do know what they're doing. Um, glad those people exist. So. Thanks for listening to The Rambling.
and I will see you all next time. Until then, happy reading.